the wait is over. I am home. Um, it's tough to do po live podcasts in the media room, Ryan, because we used to have that little side media room. Remember, have the whole backdrop, and it, it's out of commission right now for whatever reason. So, I decided, hey, I want to. I'm going to drive home. We'll do the show. Uh, give a give us some time to collect our thoughts. We talked to Brandon Bean. We talked to Kyer Elam, the newest member of the Buffalo Bills. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Welcome into Shout a Buffalo Bills Football Podcast. I'm your host Ryan uh, Matt Perino. He's my co-host <laughs> Ryan Talbot, and we got a lot to talk about. Ryan, the Bills get aggressive, go out and get their man, and this is the first time we've actually heard. Brandon Bean kind of talk about aggression about best player available, but also when best player available meets need. And that was really the impetus for why he, he was so aggressive and wanting to get up to 23 to get Kyrie Elam. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Listen, I mean, top five picks, you have two cornerbacks go back to back uh, picks three and four. Uh, so you knew that one of the premier guys were long gone. And then the, the weight was for Trent McDuffie and you get through pick 10, you get through pick 15, you get through pick 20 and he's still on the board. And I, I'm sure if you're the bills, you're feeling pretty good at that point because I'm, I'm assuming that McDuffie along with Kyrie Elam both had first round grades and Kansas city trades up though. And that changes everything. And uh, I, I can appreciate and respect the fact that Brandon Bean at that point said, listen, we need to get aggressive. The, the two teams in front of us, we didn't think we're going to be targeting cornerbacks, but all it takes is one other team to pull a Kansas City Chiefs type of move and jump ahead of Buffalo. And all of a sudden, you're left there with your hands in your pockets, having no idea uh, what to do because all your first round guys are gone. So they were able to get one of their first round uh, players. I think that's a win. Getting a boundary cornerback, someone that has elite speed, and someone that checks so many boxes, Matt, of what uh, Brandon Bean typically looks for in these draft picks based on what we've seen from 2018. It just made too much sense. And speaking of making too much sense, uh, Scott Morano pointing it out, and rightfully so, Ryan Talbot picked this on the Wednesday show. I put him on the spot. I said, who are the Bills taking to 25? And you went with Kyrie Elam. So you were a psychic this year. Well, I, I should have said trade up to 23 and then I really wouldn't. No, uh, yeah, no, that was it was pretty awesome. But, you know, what I mentioned on, on Wednesday night was the pre-draft visit that rang true again. Josh Allen, Jermaine Edmonds, Ed Oliver, and, and now Kyrie Elam, uh, all top 30 visitors, 2020, 2021, uh, no top 30 visits because of COVID. So that streak continued. And, and then when you look at the age of these prospects that Brandon Bean has drafted early, they're athletic and they're young. Josh Allen, um, Tremaine Edmonds obviously was 19 when he was drafted at Oliver 21 and you, Kyrie Elam, uh, of Dane Brugler's top 20 cornerbacks in this draft class, only Stingley and Elam are at that 20 year old mark where they're not quite 21 mm -hmm. just yet. Now Elam will turn 21 soon, but one of the younger prospects, someone that you can bring along, you're still getting, uh, you know, some of their prime years, their most athletic years. So uh, again, checks the boxes. Yeah, and you know, there's a couple things I want to get into with Kyer Elam, but but before we get too much into it, the biggest story of the week, I asked Brandon Bean about it and all the smoke around Brees Hall. And it was revealed pretty early on in his press conference that the Bills didn't have a first round grade on Brees Hall because he was still on the board. And Brandon Bean said at 25, the reason they traded up was because Ky um not Kyler Gordon, Kyer Elam was the last player on their board with a first round grade. So they got aggressive. So all of this talk all week long about the Bills targeting Brees Hall at 25 was basically proven to be false. I mean, Brandon Bean came out and said tonight that he doesn't believe in doing smoke screens. Um, I think that goes back to just, you know, a certain way that they do business. Remember when the Washington commander situation unfolded with JD McKissick and the, how personal Brandon Bean took that because there's a level of professionalism that I feel like, they like to operate with and almost kind of expect of other people. Uh, maybe sometimes that's a little bit naive, but whatever the case may be. So he, nothing's coming out of the bills building when it comes to these kinds of reports. It's something we talked about on Wednesday and why I was so skeptical of it on Wednesday morning. So listen, this is not to say that the bills don't like breeze hall. There's a very good chance that they do like him and maybe target him in the second round if it works out. But to, all the reports that you know were linking him at 25 to the Bills, it never really seemed to add up. And and Brandon Bean kind of put out that fire, if you will, despite all the smoke that was around it. 
Yeah, he splashed some cold water on it. That's absolutely true. And, and you mentioned it. Maybe Hall is is in the running in round two if he's still on the board at 57. Uh, not sure that Bean's going to want to trade up again here in, in round two to and sacrifice any other future picks or later picks that they have in this draft. But uh, th- they're going to go best player available just like they do every round, and maybe it's a possibility in round two. But, you know, listen, Hall – was the consensus top running back in, in this draft, and he did not get drafted tonight. It, it kind of speaks about the value of running backs in today's NFL. Um, I like what Brandon Bean said about he didn't put any smoke screens out there. It's, it was probably just connecting the dots from the national media. It could be agents speaking about, oh, yeah, you know, we think this team really likes him, and uh, all of a sudden then the wheels can start spinning and it gets turned into like a game of telephone where it's not that we think they like him. It's all, oh, yeah, they're, they're really interested in him and the wording changes a little bit. So whatever actually happened, who knows, but it wasn't coming out of Buffalo. Uh, that doesn't mean that Brees Hall couldn't end up here. Couldn't end up being a great player in this league. He, they just weren't in the running for him in round one because they didn't have that kind of grade on him. So Kyer Elam goes before uh, with Andrew Booth and Kyler Gordon still on the board and also a favorite uh, in the mock draft community linking to the Bills for the last two months, and that's Daxton Hill, who you had in your final uh, mock draft. So I think it kind of tells you how much the Bills really like this player. And it's a speedy guy. He he ran a 4.39 at the Combine. He's got some, some length. I don't think he quite met the 31-inch arm marker i think he came in just just below it but if you're t- talking about measurables and, and and the traits that you're looking for with what they want to do at the position the kind of player they want to add in that defensive backfield he kind of like checks all the boxes um brandon bean actually gave us some insight into the process with cornerback we talked about it last offseason the bills were, were looking at cornerback in the first round when they took Greg Rousseau, it just all of the ones that they had a first round grade on were gone by the time they picked and there weren't any trade opportunities. Side note, this was a really interesting development, the way that this all happened with them trading up because the Bills were in a weird position where they almost had to get aggressive because if they didn't and Elam goes in one of those two spots, whether it be somebody trading up or one of those two teams taking them. Then you're left in a situation where, okay, we don't have a first round grade. We got to get out of this spot. Mm. And if they can't get out of that spot, you end up having to take a player that you don't have in that range. And almost like, I don't want to say it's a a wasted pick, but it's one of those things where it's nerve wracking and you might have to take a player that you didn't necessarily have super high on your board. Brandon Bean also said that when it comes to the cornerback position, they've had interest in free agent cornerbacks, this free agent period. Some of them were just out of their price range and they decided to spend their dollars in the defensive line. They go young in the draft at cornerback, a a, a nice speedy developmental player. If you're talking about the blueprint, all of these pieces of it, um, it hasn't been perfect all along. And I'm sure, you know, Bill's fans wanted this cornerback addressed uh, issue addressed earlier. Uh, Brandon Bean even joked today that he's heard it from neighbors, his kids, Mm. um, the media fans. Uh, it's finally done and people can 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 sleep right in this sleep now. And it's it's kind of that complete now vision being accomplished here with uh, w- with this roster. Yeah, exactly right, Matt. And it, it was interesting to hear him talk, though, about last year's draft class, because I was just going back and looking. You had Greg Newsom going around 26 in that draft class. You had Eric Stokes going 29. Um and then that was right before Buffalo's pick. And then you even had uh, Caleb Farley going around 20, I believe, to Tennessee. So who who knows who those cornerbacks were, but they, they came off the board and he doesn't press. He sticks with the best players available. He sticks with those players that have first round grades. Uh, so, again, he, he doesn't change his philosophy. He's not going to uh, be backed into a wall, so to speak. Uh, and that's something I really like about him because – I think that you're more successful that way in the NFL. If you're if you're not reaching for a player or a need, you're you're just going for those best players available. Those guys are going to have more like the more likelihood to shine uh, and be major contributors for that team. As for the free agents, uh, you look at early free agency, some of the ones that did go and how much money they ha- uh, ended up getting. Even later in free agency, a, a guy like Stefan Gilmore, if there was interest there, he ended up getting a decent. Uh, payday from the Indianapolis Colts. So probably not what the Bills were looking to shell out. Now, uh, you, you know, Kyrie Elam probably takes them out of the, the veteran cornerback game, at least of the premier players that are out there still. 
Uh, but had they have missed on Elam, someone trade ahead of them and, and select him, you know, then I think maybe they would have been aggressive for an Xavier Rhodes or a Joe Hayden, something like that. But now that's not something that the Bills fans need to really worry about. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about it at the top. You know, the the philosophy of what the Bills gave up to get up to, to, to make this draft pick. And listen, at first you look at a fourth round pick in this year's draft, knowing that that's kind of the meat of this draft. And, and you probably have some reservations at the start if you're a Bills fan, right? But the more you kind of think about the scope of it all and, you know, where the Bills sit and the, the picks that they, they have after that, they have four picks after that fourth round pick, Ryan. So maybe they can move some things around, move up if they, if they see somebody that they really like, maybe trade back at another spot to add another middle of the, the pack pick. There's tons of options. And, and this draft is so deep that I feel like this is the kind of move. If you, if you have one potential impact player, and I think this is the one position we, we talked about running back. We talked about interior offensive line. I still think they can add an impact interior offensive line in the middle of the draft. This is the one position where I think you can get to compete for a starting job from the very jump. And if that player wins it and is on the field day one, that's the kind of um, addition that I think can make the kind of impact that, you know, Brandon Bean got aggressive for. Exactly. There is very few spaces or spots on this team where you could bring someone in round one and expect them to actually be in the running for a starting job. You you could look at Brees Hall, um, even if they would have drafted him, was he going to start over Devin Singletary? Probably not early on. If you draft one of the mm -hmm. wide receivers, uh, are they going to start? No, not when you have Stefan Diggs and Gabriel Davis and Jamison Crowder. Uh, offensive lineman, we talked about that. Saffold and Ryan Bates. It, you know, injury occurs. Yes, they could get called into action. So all those other areas that we've talked about, yes, they could get uh, those positions could and should probably get drafted over these last two days of the draft. But cornerback was the major position where you could get someone in here to compete for a starting job and someone that could log, you know, major reps and snaps as a rookie. The draft itself, I want to talk more about Kyer Elam, but let's let's kind of zoom out a little bit and and some takeaways from the draft itself. You know, pretty ho hum in the first ten, Ryan. I mean, if you go through those first ten picks, it's it lines up with a lot of mock drafts that you've probably seen. You've probably seen those players mock to those teams pretty much at least one time. The biggest maybe headline grabber was Kayvon Thibodeau at five to the to the Giants, which by the way, you know. Brian Dable and Joe Shane go to the NFC, their first draft, and they address both lines. Hmm. Shocker, right? Coming from the, the the Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott tree, they go Thibodeau, and then they bounce back with Evan Neal at tackle, uh, offensive tackle in the, at seven. Um, but what what were some of your takeaways from that top ten? And and really, that's when after the top ten stopped, that's when the trade machine happened. I think there were three straight trades yeah. at one point. Uh, AJ uh, Brown gets traded from the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Marquise Brown gets traded to the Cardinals. I mean, this was about as fast-paced, furious of a, of a draft as I can remember. Yeah, uh, the big takeaway for me from the top 10 is both New York teams did very well for themselves. And, and obviously, uh, the Jets coming back late in the run and grabbing another uh, premier pass rusher, I thought that those two teams maybe had the best, two of the best first rounds or best drafts early on here. Now, mind you, uh, when, when you have two picks in the top 10, you should be able to nail them hypothetically based on your needs. And, and you look first... Uh, at the Giants, you mentioned it, uh, premier pass rusher on on paper, someone that could develop into that type of player. And I love the Giants' strategy. When they were up on the board, they could have had their pick of any offensive lineman, but they also said, well, we could do that, or we could get this defensive uh, end, this edge rusher that we think has an incredibly high ceiling and, and know that maybe we won't have every offensive tackle, but we're going to be able to pick through two other guys that we really, really like. That was a smart philosophy. Um, the Jets did a nice job as well, having but they had Sauce Gardner fall right into their lap. We had talked uh, pretty much the most of the draft process about Sauce Gardner, then Stingley, but as of late, we we acknowledged the fact that Stingley was jumping up the draft boards that very real potential that he would go first, and sure enough, that happened. So, like you said, there weren't a ton of surprises in the first ten picks in terms of the prospects that were taken. Um, based on mock drafts that have been out there, a lot of those guys were where they landed. Uh, but it was still smart drafting, smart strategy by a lot of these teams in the top 10. 
I mean, for the Jets, I, I, it just really sticks out to me to for them to get Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson and then come back with um, Jermaine Johnson at the bottom half. Uh, just quite a haul. The one thing that I was talking to some a fan in, the, in my DMs about is like, listen, this is a really good draft for the Jets. Don't get me wrong. But just let's 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 calm it down a little bit. I mean, they still have Zach Wilson, at quarterback. These are rookie players. Uh, it's it's a few really nice building blocks but there's a lot that needs to transpire for that organization and they're on the right track like listen honestly if you're projecting out the jets and the patriots right now and this is something we talked about a couple months ago i, I don't know man give, give me the jets right now next season or the patriots i think there's a really good chance we're looking at the the worst team in the afc east in the new england patriots right now sitting here right now on april 29th it, it, it might be that bad um I don't know if I'd, I'd put the Jets in the same class as the Miami Dolphins, who I don't think are in the same class as the Buffalo Bills. So it's going to be interesting to see what this new look um, division looks like next year with a lot of new pieces, a lot of new parts. That middle of the of the round was super interesting because you got the Saints to trade up for Chris Olave at 11, which I thought, listen, both of us were really high on Chris Olave in on this podcast, but that is a that is really rich to get up to eleven to mm -hmm. get a guy that I think you probably could have waited a couple more picks, but maybe not. I mean, the run on receivers really began. We saw Traylon Burks go at eighteen. We saw Jahad Dotson go at at uh, sixteen. Uh, Jamison Williams he goes off the board as um, a, a big time trade up for him by the Detroit Lions from thirty two. Everybody saw that that trade up, and I think as people were talking about on social media, all right, is this where the quarterback? goes and then all the way at 20 a quarterback finally goes to the Steelers it's not Malik Willis it's it's Kenny Pickett so we know what happened with the Patriots trading down a very questionable pick at the end of the round we can talk about that in a minute and then the Bills take their pick a lot of just really fun stuff in this in this first round yeah first the, the you know the two trades um I I like Alave. I'm not sure the Saints are at that place where you, you mm -hmm. trade up for him he He's not the missing piece that's going to get you over the hump and into the Super Bowl. If you if you're in New Orleans, you know you don't have Drew Brees there anymore. Obviously, he's been out of the game. You, you just lost Sean Payton. I feel like there are still a lot of pressing needs on this team. So uh, I'm not quite sure if that move is going to pan out long term. But they did get a talented player, and I guess at the end of the day, that that's your end game. Uh, and if they're happy with what they gave up to get them, so be it. Yeah, the Lions jump up was interesting because there were um, a few media outlets that actually reported it was Kenny Pickett that was going to be the pick. And, and then, nope, that's not how it ended up at, at, at all. So that was really interesting, too. So a little bit of wildness there. And then you had veterans getting traded, too, in this first round. Uh, Hollywood Brown leaves the Ravens and, and ends up in Arizona, a move to kind of appease Kyler Murray. And you kind of sit there and say, oh, OK, oh, wow, you know, they're, they're moving on from a former first round pick. That's a that's a pretty big deal. And then it's, minutes later, it's A.J. Brown and, he, and he's mm -hmm. gone. And that's the actual big deal of all these veterans. He got paid a, a good amount of money in Philadelphia and, uh, you know, Tennessee ends up drafting someone that was compared to skill set wise to Brown. So maybe that, that pays off for them. So for the most part, the prospects, Matt, that we thought were going to get drafted in the first round, we're, we're going to go until, well, the Patriots got strange. Literally. Right. <laughs> All right, let's get back to Kyrie Elam. Uh, break down this pick a little bit for everybody. Super, super interesting pick. Um, actually, before we do, we got a, we got a super chat. Super chats always throw me off, Ryan, because they appear on the right side in yeah. these huge bubbles. Um, and for people that are watch that are listening to the to this episode, super chats on YouTube, uh, fans can I guess pay to have their um com we're still getting used to this, have their comments appear on the show. Carl Tommen, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. What's up, Carl? Thank you so much for the super chat. I wanted offensive guard Zion Johnson. Obviously, he went a few picks for the before the Bills, but a CB cornerback was a need the bills had pre-draft visits from Kyer elam and andrew booth so they got to evaluate them face to face and actually carl thank you for this because this is a great trans mm -hmm. transition to what i actually wanted to talk about brandon bean really took us into the process of how they scouted Kyer elam it started at um the combine obviously he wasn't at the senior bowl he's a 20 year old junior had a really nice career in florida six interceptions i think it was 26 pass breakups in three seasons uh two and a half tackles for a loss um so they got to meet him at the combine and they were impressed right away with the with the 
player, the person. Then he talked about like the evaluation process and what they saw from him on tape that really stood out. Go back to the Kansas City game, Ryan. What were the big kind of plays that that really killed the Bills? Those short drag routes, those those uh, those deep post patterns where you know you you let a guy get out in space and, and cornerbacks just can't stay with them in that one on one coverage. Uh, that's what. Brandon Bean saw in film with Kyrie Elam. He was watching an Alabama game versus Florida, and it was he couldn't remember if it was against John Mechie or Jamison Williams. But there was one play where he, you know, the the receiver was running one of those kind of routes, and all he noticed from Kyrie Elam was him sticking on him stride for stride. That's that four three nine speed that I think really stands out, and that was the real. Um, skill set that I think the Bills needed to add in the defensive uh, backs room. That's what they get in Kyrie Elam. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to Carl's point mentioning uh, that they also brought in Andrew Booth, you know, Booth won. I, I'm sure there was legitimate interest there, but bringing in a player like that, that was a great chance for the Bills to do a medical check on him. Uh, mm. and, and if you have any questions, you, you can't take a player uh, like that in round one. There's just too much risk. Now, we, we saw he fell right out of round one. He's still a very talented cornerback. I anticipate um, – his name coming off the board pretty early tomorrow, as long as he he has that medical check from at least one or two of these teams that pick early in round two. But you all, you know, when you compare the skill sets, when you compare the injury histories or who's healthy, who's not right now, the risk reward, uh, Kyrie Elam stands out head, you know, head and shoulders right now over what Andrew Booth is in, it, it is at this point because you don't know about the double hernia surgery. You don't know how that could affect him. He had the surgery. You hope he comes back full, uh, full strength, but it's not a guarantee. So uh, smart of them to obviously bring him in because that's one of the, the reasons that you held these top 30 visits. It's not just to sit down and watch film with them or to interview them further. It's to do those medical checks. Mm -hmm. And speaking of top 30 visits, I mean, talk about a top 30 visit for the ages with Kyer Elam. I mean, Brandon Bean took us into that a little bit, too. And uh, he was asked about Tredavious White and if if Trey's status had anything to do with them being so urgent about a cornerback. And he said that the injury is not an, a concern. It's more of something that's just an unknown at this point, like what the timeline is going to be. He's still too far out to kind of put a date on it. Um, and obviously they lost Levi and uh, Dane Jackson's done a really good job. And he said some really nice things about, about him, but this is a situation where you add a guy in Kyer Elam who comes into the building, impresses everybody with what, everybody already saw on tape. Then he comes in and he meets Tredavious white and he's trying to pick his brain and they, they go take him to lunch afterwards after he gets a chance to meet him a little bit. And they ask him, do you have any questions for us? And the first thing out of Kyer Elam's mouth is, well, yeah, what, it, what makes Tredavious white so great? I mean, you guys have had him for five years and what about my game? Have you watched that you think I really need to improve? And those are the kind of, you know, poignant questions that I think as an evaluator, as coaches, you look at that prospect and that player and you say, this is a guy that wants to be the best version of himself. I mean, that's their calling card right inside the building. And so they, he just impressed them. He stood out to them. You know, you can have all the speed in the world. You can have all the interceptions in the world, but part of the evaluation process and why it's not just, this is the part of draft season that you can't project. It's about how are you going to get this guy in our building, have him be a fit for what we do and be able to develop him. It's not just about, can he get better? It's, does he have the the right ingredients to be coached and to, to, to get that stuff out of him? So to have him come in here and impress the way that he did, that really stuck out to, to Brandon Bean and obviously Sean McDermott. Yeah. Asking the right questions can go a long way in, in the pre-draft process, wanting to know what they saw in Trey White. And I'm sure the Bills had a great answer uh, and a great breakdown of what they saw at the time when they drafted him. Obviously, Brandon Bean was not the GM at that point, but I'm sure he had a high grade on, on White as well. He was still with Carolina at that point, came over shortly after that draft. Um, but I'm sure the Bills gave a great answer on that. And then when it came to, you know, what do you see in my game that you like so much? I think that's a great question because because – then they have they're going to be open and honest with you. Uh, you have a better idea of their their true intentions. Am I someone that's really going to be on on their board or one of those last picks when uh, they get up on the clock? And sure enough, it came to fruition. So it's always interesting when you get those little inside tid uh, tidbits. And it wouldn't surprise me when Bills Embedded comes out uh, for the draft here in you know a few weeks, whatever the case may be. That maybe we get some clips from 
his visit or his first few days here. And you get to kind of see a little bit more about how he ticks and, and hear these, you know, hear more about that experience. It's something that I think a lot of Bills fans, they, they like to look behind the curtain, so to speak. And uh, they would really enjoy something like that. Rob asks if they, if, if we think that they had an interest in McDuffie, I, I was told, you know, during the lead up to the process by a source that, there, there was interest in both both Washington corners, and and who knows, maybe they, maybe McDuffie was one of the guys that that there was a first grade, first round grade on it. But the real truth of the matter is, you know, Kyer Elam was it seems like was the guy that they had kind of circled, and they were watching this thing play out. As a matter of fact, Brandon Bean said early on when Sauce Gardner and uh, Stingley went three four, that immediately they thought, man, okay. There's probably going to be a run on corners at some point. We might have to move on to a different position. And then the tr- the draft went along. There was that run on receivers and then those big time trades, which are something that you can't project in a mock draft. Even when you're going through the scenarios, you're not you're not throwing in a trade for AJ Brown in the middle of the round of the round <laughs> right. or a trade for Marquise Brown. So it's a situation when those things start to occur. It's like, okay, these the people are moving around. You see Tennessee trade uh Brown and then they draft Traylon Burks is like, okay, maybe they didn't have a first round grade on Burks or think that he was going to go there and it starts pushing people down. Then the quarterback goes, then it starts to kind of speed up. Like, okay, we have this pocket of, of, of cornerbacks, at least one of them. We know Kyrie Elam, we have a first round grade on let's get aggressive. Let's get up. You still have two uh, day two picks that I think you can add some value. And it just seemed like the aggression there. It was uh, what, what was the, um, what was the Vince McMahon term back in the day, back during the Attitude Era? Ruthless uh, aggression. Ruthless aggression. There's a little ruthless aggressive, but it was also um, uh, cerebral aggression. Uh, that's what I was thinking of. The game. That was his little catch, cut line back in the day, uh, catchphrase. Um, but no, I, I really like the way that Brandon Bean approached it. And it avoid again, it avoided a situation where you get down to 25. Elam's off the board. You have no first round grades and potentially run out of time to trade back, even though it's something that he said they definitely were considering that had they not gotten a guy that they wanted at 50 at at 25, they might want to move back when you need somebody that wants to move up and no quarterbacks went from 25 to 32. And so now we're sitting here at the end of the first round, one quarterback went and that was a 20 of the Steelers. It was Kenny Pickett. And so Without that need to get back into the first round, no aggression, uh, the rest of the board to get a running back. Brandon Bean might have had to sit on his hands and just pick the the top guy on his board that had a second round grade. Yeah, uh, and it would have been interesting to hear if he would have been that honest about it, if he had a first round grade on whoever that prospect would have been. Now, I, I do think that maybe he would have been able to find a trade partner. I know that the Vikings picked last in the first round. Uh, and they said that they fielded a few calls about the pick, so maybe the Bills probably would have had a few some interest as well, depending on what they would have received in return. Um, but going back to the original question, yeah, I would anticipate that McDuffie had a first round grade from the Bills, simply because once he went off the board, that probably narrowed it down to one pick. If you have two guys on the board and you're in the early twenties, you you feel pretty good about your chances, especially when the teams in front of you aren't necessarily. Uh, you know, looking at that uh, position. But if one team jumps ahead, like Kansas City did, or one of them comes off the board, then, you know, they they force your hand to a certain extent. And I would rather have Brandon Bean in that scenario, get aggressive, give a a fourth round pick, a late fourth round pick at at that, uh, to go up and get your guy. Ensure that you are still getting a player that you have a first round value on. A player that, Matt, we've already said, has a chance to come in, play significant reps as a rookie, and, and be a key contributor to this team. So all in all, it was the right move. But yes, I, I would anticipate that McDuffie also had a first-round grade for this team. couple of housekeeping items. Um, we launched our new newsletter today. We're super excited about it. We talked about it on the podcast uh, on Wednesday. Basically, you go to Syracuse.com slash newsletters. Check the Shout uh, Buffalo Football newsletter, and then at the bottom, put in your email address, and then hit sign up, and then boom, all of our coverage from this weekend is going to get delivered to your inbox on Monday. And then every week after that, once a week, you will get an email with all the coverage right to your inbox. It's just an an easier one-stop shop. I'm super excited about this, Ryan. And Matthew Harmon has a great point. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. 
at 1 15 a.m eastern time smash that like button hit that subscribe a- as well i really appreciate it I- i'm excited about all these little things we got going on ryan yeah me too and you know what else i'm excited about day two of the draft i see a lot of comments in here mad about uh players they could target i, I feel like the bills of all three days of the draft, it feels almost like they've done the most due diligence on day two, where they think they're going to get the, the best value. I'm going to I'm going to rattle off some names for you, Matt, from their their top 30 visitors. Uh, you still have Roger McCreary. I don't know if they'd go back to the cornerback well or not. Chad Muma, that was the name I saw in the chat. Uh, you have Christian Harris, Dylan Parham, Sean Ryan. Um, you know, I'm going more so for second round guys here. Uh, Brees Hall. Uh, Nick Cross, and, and then you still have the guys that you had in for, or that you went for private workouts for. Trey McBride, the top tight end in this draft class. You worked out three Alabama defend or Alabama Oklahoma defenders, excuse me. All three of them second round guys. So, and that's just a small sample size. They looked at a lot of prospects that are, are going to fall on day two of this draft. So, I, I'm really excited to see first of all how how the second round starts to unfold. Uh, and who falls into Buffalo's lap because based on the due diligence that they've done, they're going to have some options, uh, in my opinion, at least, when 57 comes up. Yeah, so let's get into some strategy here, Ryan. You mentioned a bunch of names. There's some some really interesting ones on the board. You figure early on on day two, because only one quarterback left went, there's going to be probably two or three that maybe go – in the second round before the bills pick, which is potentially going to move some people down. Who are some targets that you're looking at right now that you're like, all right, if I'm the bills, I'm, I'm kind of eyeing that guy. And I think a, a trade up could be in play, even though they, they traded the fourth round pick and maybe you think stay put or, you know, trade back and maybe add, add, add picks. If you do trade up again in round two, who are some of the targets? Yeah, if you're if you're gonna trade up in, in round two, I I think Muma. Uh, you, you started to see a few linebackers go. Now the Bills only play though with with two linebackers on the field a lot. You, you'd have to be have a pretty strong conviction about that. I think Trey McBride. If if you're serious about running two tight end sets, I know you have OJ Howard and Dawson Knox, uh, but this is the number one tight end in this draft class. Both of those tight ends that I just mentioned in Knox and Howard are free agents at the end of this season. I, I think that Knox, however, is a part of their future plans, and it's it's something that they'll work on a long-term deal with him. That doesn't mean that Howard uh, won't be. Uh, running backs, you know, I, I know they've been linked to Brees Hall, but maybe Kenneth Walker's in play in round two. I don't trade up for him in the, in necessarily or any of those backs. And, and then you have to look – you know, wide receiver is a tough one now, Matt. There was, a, there was quite the run on wide receiver. So if the Bills are serious about wide receiver, uh, are they going to trade up in round two? I, I think that um, a lot of the bigger names left go early in the round. If they want to get a receiver on day two, you know, there's John Mechie the third, who they brought in for a top 30, Kelvin Austin the third, uh, someone they did a lot of homework on. So, there are options out there and a quick shout out. I believe it was Sophia who, who uh, showed us some love here in the comments. We appreciate you, uh, you know, saying thanks for staying up late. So we, we love doing this, Sophia. Uh, Matt, what about you? Is there anyone that uh, you're targeting? Oh, Sky Moore. I see in the chat. Yes. Yeah, Sky Moore is someone I would trade up for. I think Watson goes very early in round two. That's just my opinion though. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple guys hanging out there that I think are, are are super interesting. I think Brees Hall, for as much as we talked about him at the top of the show, the Bills could very much like that player and that skill set and maybe just felt more uh, the value was in the second round. And, and if I, I did a mock draft today, I had the Bills trade out of the first round, take Kyler Gordon, which ended up being wrong, right position, wrong player. And then... Um, I had him trade up in the second round to, to get up and get Brees Hall. And I think that could be a move that I, I really could get behind. I think it makes a lot of sense. Another move is I mentioned it as kind of a sleeper guy. Um, I think on one of the shows that we did last uh, earlier in the week, Jaquan Brisker, the safety out of Penn state. We know Sean McDermott knows that program really well. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if they'd done their work on him as well. It sounded like Sean McDermott said he did a lot of work on the defensive backs. And if that's somebody that they, you know, a young developmental talent, I know that they have Jaquan Johnson. I know that they have 
uh, DeMar Hamlin, to be honest with you, because they have those two guys. I've been a little bit more lukewarm on the idea of a safety, especially early on. You change things up for a generational potential guy like Kyle Hamilton, who ended up going 14th today, which I think surprised some people. I thought he was going to go top 10 for sure by the time we got to the draft. Um, but so Br- Brees Hall is one guy that I think could be really interesting. Another name to remember is, is somebody we talked about on the show the other day, wide receiver George Pickens who if, if you can make a splash, if you can add a big-time playmaker uh, on offense, I think Pickens is a guy that you maybe look at, maybe even a Watson, like you mentioned. I think he's going to go very early. But if you want to get aggressive and you want to get up and maybe you trade uh, uh, maybe a third next year if you want to keep that third and maybe uh, your fifth this year, um, whatever the whatever the trade ends up being, um, I wouldn't mind getting aggressive if you really like a guy. Now, if you stay pat and you just see how the board plays out, there's going to be some interior offensive line options there, like you mentioned. And I also think there's some really sneaky good third round receivers. In my last um, mock draft, I had uh, the SMU receiver who the more and more you look at him, I, I know a lot of people were really excited about Calvin Austin, the third. I know some people really like Sky Moore, rightfully so. I mean, he could have probably been a first round pick. Danny Gray out of SMU, smaller guy, 5'11", ran 4'3", 3 at the combine. And Daniel Jeremiah actually said he thought he could run even faster. Hmm. Boom. Add some speed if you can get in the third round. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point there. Uh, there's talent across the board in this draft. And, uh, you know, I see someone saying Pickens isn't, isn't a character fit. Yeah, th- there are red flags about his character. I, we we both have said that throughout this draft process. But uh, if the Bills won, they've talked to him and they feel like he they can uh, work with him. That, uh, that alone says a lot. And two, Buffalo has built up the culture in that locker room quite a bit. Um, so the talent's definitely there. And in some cases, sometimes talent will trump uh, the, those character concerns you can you may have. Now, that obviously means the Bills would have had to have done their homework as well in terms of talking to him, talking to people close to him and around him. But the natural talent is there when it comes to Pickens. Uh, you, you mentioned a few guys on ESPN had them as had him as their top receiver in this draft class, which really speaks volumes based on the talented players who were in this draft class who have already come off the draft board. Um, so if the bills, you know, feel like they can do something with him, then yeah, that talent wise, that would be a slam dunk. The, the excitement level on Kyer Elam's face, uh, when we got a chance to talk to him tonight, there's been videos that have been released from when he found out the emotions kind of, you know, going on for a really young player at 20 years old. Sometimes we forget how at times some of these kids are so young. Um, you work your whole life for this moment and you, you could see how much this meant to him and the fit with the bills specifically, like we saw it all week, Ryan, uh, Dan Fates and, um, Mike Canelana are down in, in Vegas at the draft and they're, they're doing all these videos with all these prospects and they're talking about what it would be like to come play in Buffalo and, you know, the Bills Mafia fan base. You put a story up on what Jordan Davis said about that today and, um, you know, playing with Josh Allen. The Bills, despite being in Buffalo, are a destination now. And I think part of what happened uh, with this uh, match is that Kyrie Elam wants to be a Buffalo Bill. And that's a huge thing for Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott. Um, we were talking to him a little bit about um, what what was going through his mind. And he said, listen, I told Brandon Bean when he called me, like, I'm flying to Buffalo tomorrow. I want a playbook on the uh, on the plane so I can thumb through that and start getting to work. And, you know, reminds me a lot of Gabriel Davis a couple of years ago gonna, when the, just the Bills drafted that. him and he's out there. <laughs> you know, running routes to get ready. So um, he ended his um, press conference also with a go bill. So he's already kind of learning the culture. Yeah. If he gives the thumbs up and when he says it like Josh Allen or the little, you know, hat brim there, uh, then, then he's really going to be embraced wholeheartedly by this, this fan base. But no, th- th- there's certain types of players that this team loves and you hate the cliche cliche terms, but guys that love football and live for football. And that's, you know, that is the Gabriel Davis. And that is a a guy like Kair Elam, someone that wants the playbook while he's on the plane. So he can start learning it, start uh, to, to kind of absorb all of that because it's going to be a difference for all these prospects, but he, he definitely fits the DNA of those types of players that the bills want to bring in here, add to that culture, add to that locker room. And you're right though. He, he definitely wanted to, 
uh, looked excited about joining the Bills. And when, when you have a Super Bowl roster and you're a Super Bowl favorite, I think that obviously helps too uh, when it comes to hearing your name called and associated with that team. You know, there's some things that, you know, he, he's he got to develop. There, there's no doubt about that as a player. Uh, Brandon Bean was talking a little bit about that. With that speed and the size uh, measurables for Elam, there's, you know, s- some things that you got to work through when you're backpedaling at that size and that speed. And sometimes when you have that speed, you're able to get rid of some um, or overcome some technique flaws. And so that's going to be part of the early process. But you mentioned it a dozen times on this show that John Butler – um, you know, Bobby Babbage is with the linebackers now, but Jim Salgado, um, you know, Leslie Frazier, Sean McDermott specializes in defensive backs. He couldn't have landed at a better in a better spot. And Matthew uh, Harmon uh, on, on our YouTube channel, always with great comments. He says Elam is very coachable. You could tell from just talking to him how much he wants to be coached. And that's a huge part of this, too. So all of the things that you look on the weakness uh, part of his scouting report. I think the Bills are excited to get him in and see how how quickly they can turn some of those weaknesses into strengths. Yeah, the coachability part is so important. You looked at some of these former draft picks; they're all highly athletic guys. Your Josh Allen's, your Dawson Knox, your Ed Oliver's, and, and now your Kyrie Elam's. The talents there, the skill sets there. They're young guys, and they're moldable. They're, they're players that are going to be you're going to be able to work with. They're not going to be set in their ways. Not that some of these prospects that are 22, 23 are set in their ways, uh, but th- there's still so much about their games that um, haven't been unlocked yet. When you're one of these younger prospects, so I, I am looking forward to seeing what John Butler can do with a, a first round talent like Kyrie Elam. When you consider what he's done with the Levi Wallace's, the Dane Jackson's, the Cam Lewis's, uh, and some of these other players that they, they've they acquired uh, in the later stages of the draft or an undrafted free agency to see how much he's brought them along. When you have some a skill set like this, I really think that Elam, you know, the, the ceiling's so high that uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Butler can do. Uh, so everybody that is watching on here uh, on YouTube, especially because I think most of the viewers, live viewers right now are on YouTube, over 300. You guys are awesome. And it's 1.30 in the morning. You're plugging along. You're just plugged in. That's why I tell people all the time, man, like people don't get how how big time uh, Bill's football is for Bill's fans. I mean, it's, you know, two in the morning. Sometimes we're doing these shows and people are just uh, cranking along with us. Um, Hit that like button. If you're watching on YouTube, it really helps subscribe to the channel. If this is your first time here, welcome. And then do me a favor. If you got uh, your phone up or uh, got access to a laptop, head over to Syracuse.com slash newsletters. You'll come to this page right here. Scroll down. You'll get to uh, right here, shout a Buffalo Bills newsletter. Click that right there. Get down here. Put your email address in. I'll even put mine in here, even though I'm already subscribed. But I'll put it in there. Sign up. Boom. You're added to the list. And then every Thursday, uh, and a special is coming on this Monday, you will get the shout Buffalo football newsletter directly to your inbox. So you'll get all the stories. We already got. Four up on the site. I'm writing one on Breeze Hall after this. I'm writing my five thoughts and a grade on the draft pick, which will be ready for all of you early tomorrow morning. We're going to have tons, loads of content. Ryan is dropping a second, a day two mock draft tomorrow. Are you kidding me? There is so much content flowing your way and you get it all in your inbox. It'll be there for you uh, on Monday. And as always, go to Syracuse.com, NewYorkUpstate.com. It's there for you all the time. Yeah, pretty easy to make the list. So go there, uh, Syracuse.com backslash newsletters, correct, Matt? And and fill it, you know, check the shout, put in your email. It's that easy. Get the news sent directly to you. And people are asking me a lot about tops. Like, where's tops? Where's tops? Negotiations are happening. I think they're going to be back in the mix. Wink, wink. And there might be even more, which means, guess what, Ryan? We get to have some fun with all of our transitions and some new show concepts to to bring in advertisers we're so excited about it and it's all possible because of bill's mafia that's right and i know you saw it because we were tagged in like 100 videos but dingus day that the giant uh, shopping cart car i think yes. that's got to be in the contract negotiations we each get a ride we get to a ride in that shopping car car i i was interested in it. i thought that was pretty cool but yeah so uh stay tuned on the you know on the sponsors uh big things coming uh, Scott, uh, Scott Morano is checking in here and asking, we'll, we'll cover this real quick before we get out of here, but two minutes real quick. 
Um, do you think it was necessary for Brandon Bean to trade up? We kind of covered it already, but maybe not. Maybe it wasn't necessary. Maybe he could have sat there and waited for the pick. But I guess is the risk is the risk worth it if you lose out on the player like we talked about? Yeah, that that's just it. Um, if you only have one player left on your entire board with a first round grade, and it's only going to cost you uh, a fourth round pick when you have a Super Bowl type of roster already, when a fourth round pick isn't a lock to even make this roster, um, you, you it, it makes too much sense in my opinion not to. And I, and I get it. There are other needs. There's depth that you want to address, but there's no guarantees that any rookie on day three, even if it's early on day three, are going to be able to come in here and win a job on a roster this deep and this talented. There it is. Ryan Talbot. I'm putting you on the spot one more time because why not? Who do the bills take at 57 tomorrow? If he's there, Trey McBride. Boom. Tight end two, three. And is he tight end two or three? I think he's tight end end three. three. Howard. Knocks out Sweeney, but you bring him along so he can be potentially tight end two with Dawson Knox in 2023. Scott Morano saying uh, Elam, Booth, and Gordon, first round grade or not, I have to assume the grades were similar. I wouldn't assume that, actually. I mean, there's a big difference between a true first round grade and a true second round grade. I've actually been in the Bills draft room before where uh, Brandon Bean kind of mocked up a uh, a fake draft board. And there's a significant difference. Like when you watch some of these draft evaluators, they, they put out their draft list. I think a, a person that does it really well um, is Dane Brugler. When he puts out his, the beast, mm. he'll put like a, a first round grade on a guy, a second round grade One, or a first second. Even, yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe booth, maybe um, Kyler Gordon had a first second, but if they both had a straight round two grade and maybe for booth there were medical checks who knows if medical checks came back that bad that might have pushed him down to a great a, a round three or a two three and then you're talking about an entirely different stratosphere of player and i know daxton hill is kind of in the mix there too but i still have some issues some concerns if a guy that you're projecting like we've been here before with a player that has versatility cody ford is an example of it right where you say okay we think you play right tackle or we can play right guard i don't have a really have a vision for him and then you draft him and say we'll figure it out later that's not always the best way to go about it, especially with premium picks in the first and second round absolutely and you know did, did you see by chance i can't remember if it was the ravens or another team in the first half they went into the um the area where the team was drafting, you actually saw their board for a minute. That was like a big snafu oh, on no, television. I yeah, I don't know if anyone oh. yeah, it was the Ravens draft board. Um, and I don't know if anyone took a picture of it or not, but really interesting that they accidentally showed that. And, and had there been a clear picture of it, you you might have been able to see on that draft board the difference between these first round prospects and how they they grade and evaluate these players. And I see some people, you know, talking about that's very interesting. Um, I'll never uh, question what Brandon Bean does. It's okay to question it. I mean, listen, even as a fan, like some of the some what I love about Scott is he's always thinking about outside the box. And I just put him on the spot because I thought it was a good question. And um, I, I like the fact that we can ask challenging questions and discuss challenging topics and 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 important decisions. That's part of the process. This is one instance where I think being aggressive and what the bills gave up to get up, to get the guy that they believe in, which most of the time when it comes to Brandon Bean, I think a little bit to, to Harmon's point is like, he's had so many wins that if they believe this much in the player and were that worried about uh, what could be there, if they didn't get him specifically, I think it's worth seeing what that ultimately looks like. And listen, it answers a question that Brandon Bean can walk to the podium now and doesn't have to talk about cornerback anymore. And, And that in itself, I think is a kind of a big development. Yeah, I, I thought we were going to go 30 minutes, Ryan. I thought we we're going to go 30 <laughs> minutes. We're, we're, at 50. we're closing in on 50. We're at, yeah. And uh, just a quick clarification. I found a screenshot of it. It looks like it was last year's draft pick by pick and all the players. So I don't know. Maybe they, uh, I don't know why they would have that still up in the background, but that's what it looks like. But when it was live on TV, it looked like the full draft board round by round. I was able to zoom in just right now and see some of last year's players and, and the picks. But um, yeah, last thing. All right. Someone's asking about the Cole Strange pick. Yeah. Bizarre. Um, Daniel mm, Jeremiah, yeah, rip, you know, he, he kind of, I don't want to say he ripped it apart, but he was stunned. It was like, a, he said something like, wow. Um, I, I had a third round grade on him, but you know, the Patriots just, they, they go with the guys that they like Well, going with the guys that you like is not always a sound philosophy, especially if it's someone 
that could be had clearly on day two. Uh, and then you go to Sean McVay uh, in the Rams, and he's literally laughing at Bill Belichick saying, well, I guess we wasted some time on Cole Strange because we thought we could have him at 104. So peculiar. You know, the Jets got better. Uh, the Dolphins got better because they, they used some of those picks to get a Tyree kill. I can't sit here tonight and say that the Patriots got better in free agency or night one of the draft. One of our regulars needs to go back to the episode. I think it was sometime in February or maybe right around free agency where I said, I thought the Patriots going to finish fourth in the AFC East. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to receipt that and bring that up uh, in December when we're probably going to new England around Christmas again. And if they're going to finish in last place, I'm going to, I want to post that on, on social media because I've had a really good feeling of a, a really good, um, feel for this division for the last couple of years. I mean, I kind of saw the Miami, uh, you know, uh, thing happening where they were developing what they were doing down there with Brian, Brian Flores before that went South. And I thought that they were kind of, you know, overtaking new England a little bit. And that's ultimately kind of what happened. And obviously they're in a really good spot. I think they're a playoff contender. Now there's questions about the quarterback, but you know, the Jets are making really good moves. There's questions about Zach Wilson, but the roster itself is so healthy and so strong. What the Patriots are doing, I, I really quite, I don't quite get it. And if, if Elam ends up turning out to be a guy, like I'm talking about a guy, a guy that the Bills are going to have to extend on the other side of, of after picking up his fifth year contract, what were the Patriots doing at 21? Yeah. Something to yeah. think about. Fair, fair question. Uh, I All right, we got to get out of here, Ryan. Oh, All go on, right. finish your point. No, no. No, no, no. Finish uh, your, no, no, no. <laughs> I want you to finish your point. No, I'm just saying I, I think it is interesting that they, they traded down and obviously taking Strange at 21 would have been a real head scratcher, but it, it still wasn't enough of a move there. Um, they have needs. They, you know, th there was a lot of players where you retweeted the the Boston media player that, or media person that said, oh, between – this the Chiefs pick and, and the, you know the Patriots pick. There's all these players they can't go wrong. And then he retweeted himself and said, "I guess they could," uh, because <laughs> all those first round talents they passed on. They passed on the pass rusher that the, the uh, Johnson that the Jets ended up getting. They they passed on so many talented players, uh, Hill and, and you name it. So really interesting. Maybe Cole Strange. Maybe they know something everyone else doesn't know, and he goes on to be this all world player. Um, but. Yeah, it definitely does not seem like a smart pick at this time. Uh, Scott wants to know who I got them taking at 57. Um, I could kind of go Brees Hall just because I had a mock there, but I'm going to go Sean Ryan. I, I really liked one of the mocks uh, that you did, and you wrote a little bit about him. I think that's a really interesting piece. I think he fits well there, and maybe it could even be a scenario where the Bills can, if some of these quarterbacks do last and, and teams aren't really jumping to, to draft them, maybe one or two of them last that long. Somebody wants to move up to 57 to get one of them. You move back a couple spots and then get that fourth rounder back, and then all of a sudden everybody that was complaining about the fourth rounder, it's back in the mix. So I'm going to go Sean Ryan. Uh, guard. I think they need to add some depth there in this draft. I, I, I'm not, I've not been bashful about that. Um, and what I think everybody else needs to do is go to Syracuse.com slash newsletters, sign up for the shout Buffalo football newsletter by clicking the box, going down, put your email address in, hit sign up. You'll get all the content right to your inbox and, and boom, if you're listening on all the audio platforms, thank you so much. We appreciate you hit that like, and subscribe before you go Three fifty. Two in the morning, Ryan Talbot. I'm Matt Perino. See you tomorrow. We'll be right back.